I am arguing for socialism, not against it, but for the moment, I am devil's advocate. In this episode of Philosophers Explained by Me, Stephen Hicks, we're turning to George Orwell's 1937 book, The Road to Wigan Pier, written at the height of the Depression, two years before World War II is to break out in Europe. In it, Orwell is reflecting on what he takes to be the sad state of socialist theorizing and activism and offer some advice for reforming the socialist movement. Let's go to the text. What about socialism? In Road to Wigan Pier, in the first part, George Orwell had functioned as a journalist traveling through parts of England, uh, especially some of the parts that had been most hit by the Depression. Uh, recording the poverty and sense of hopelessness and sometimes sense of anger at the desperate circumstances in those places. He does not think the problem is solvable, and so now he wants to turn to what he thinks is the solution, socialism of some sort. Where does socialism fit in the intellectual, cultural, and activist map of Britain at, at this time? Now, his assessment then is uh, that things are desperate and they cannot be improved under the current circumstance. This green section here highlighted in the second paragraph, we are living in a world in which nobody is free. And a couple of lines later, there is no chance of those conditions showing any fundamental improvement. The current system is broken. It's uh, leading to millions of people in desperate circumstances. And uh, it's not only the circumstances materially, but it's also the circumstances psychologically, politically, and so forth. We have a free, an unfree rather, and unimprovable current system. Now, what's the solution? Well, Orwell thinks it's uh, straightforward and obvious. All the while, everyone who uses his brain knows that socialism as a world system and wholeheartedly applied is a way out. And it's not like a big heavy lift intellectually from Orwell's perspective. Socialism is such elementary common sense. So we're not going to be uh, getting into complicated arguments for or against socialism. We are going to take it for granted that that is the solution. And in some sense, it's the obvious solution. That we then get a short description of uh, uh, kind of the main message of socialism. The world is a raft sailing through space with potentially plenty of provisions for everybody. The idea that we must all cooperate and see to it that everyone does his fair share of the work and gets his fair share of the provisions seems so blatantly obvious that one would say that no one could possibly fail to accept it unless he had some corrupt motive for clinging to the present system. All right, so that's what socialism is, right? There is plenty, potentially, we're all in it together, that's on the raft, so therefore we have to cooperate, we all should be making sure that everybody's doing their work uh, and everybody's getting their share, and the word fairness is uh, repeated twice in there as, a, as an operative value concept as well. Yet, the fact that we have got to face is that socialism is not establishing itself. Instead of going forward, the cause of socialism is visibly going back. And so it's not only from his perspective that the current system, he describes it as capitalism, is failed, dead, gone. Many or most intellectuals of the time will agree. And so it seems like that should be a great opportunity for socialism. Instead, socialism, he wants to argue, is declining. But what then is ascending? At this moment, socialists almost everywhere are in retreat before the onslaught of fascism. fascism rather. So it's fairly common in the teens, 20s, and 30s to uh, do big picture political economy analysis and say it's really a choice between some kind of capitalism, some kind of socialism, and some kind of fascism. By the time we get to the 30s, uh, uh, Orwell says it's, uh, it's, it's like the capitalism is out, at least intellectually and morally speaking, and so it comes down to a battle between socialism and fascism, but fascism is in 
the ascendancy in the 1930s. He mentions the Spanish fascists. He uh, goes a little further to the east and then what's going on in Italy and the rise of Mussolini. He does not here mention uh, German fascism or German national socialism, but clearly that's on everyone's mind also in 1930. Seven, And so Orwell then wants to say, you know, uh, is there something wrong with fascism? Uh, uh, why is uh, socialism in such problem? It was so much in its favor. For every empty belly is an argument for socialism. The idea of socialism is less widely accepted than it was 10 years ago. The average thinking person nowadays is not merely not a socialist. He is actively hostile to socialism. So what then is the problem? <clears throat> well, here's uh, Orwell's analysis. This must be due chiefly to mistaken methods of propaganda. It means that socialism in the form in which it is now presented to us has about it something inherently distasteful, something that drives away the very people who ought to be knocking to its support. Now, uh, Orwell wants to argue that within socialism, there has been a sea change, partly driven by 1917 and what happened uh, uh, with respect to the Russian Revolution. Huge numbers of people flocking to the Marxist socialist cause, then, then the Marxist Leninist cause, and then Lenin had died and Stalin took over. But still, huge numbers of people on the socialist side of the fence are flocking toward Russia, the Soviet Union, and that version of Marxism. And to the extent that that version is dominant, it seems like, well, you know, we just have to wait and see because of Marxist doctrine. It seems that only yesterday that socialists, especially orthodox Marxists, were telling me with superior smiles that socialism was going to arrive of its own accord by some mysterious process called historic necessity. Uh, now, we do have another episode on Marx and Engels and their Communist Manifesto in this Philosopher's Explained series, so we can check that out if we want uh, to, uh, to the side here. But what uh, Orwell wants to argue is that by the time we get to the 1930s, that belief has been uh, exploded, perhaps, uh, perhaps hopefully from his perspective, but at least is in a back seat because it seems like this historical necessity, socialists have been waiting an awfully long time for it to happen, and it is not happening. Hence, the sudden attempts of communists in various countries to ally themselves with democratic forces, which they have been sabotaging for years past. Part of Marxist socialism or communism is the idea that socialism has to be achieved by a violent revolution, not by democratic evolution. And so they had been sabotaging, attacking democracy uh, 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 as part of their activist strategy for a long time. But now uh, Orwell is saying that many of the people who would have, uh, were traditionally Marxist in that sense are now repackaging themselves and trying to say, well, maybe we need to incorporate some democratic elements or become democratic socialists uh, and, and tone down the, the, uh, the, uh, the violent arguments uh, and, and rhetoric as much as possible. Now, okay, that then is a sign uh, of some re serious rethinking within socialism uh, in response to its apparent failures. Uh, but at the same time, uh, Orwell wants to say it's not only uh, that we uh, uh, need to, to do some internal examination, it's also how we talk about people who are not themselves socialists. It is no use writing off the current distaste for socialism as the product of stupidity or corrupt motives. If you want to remove that distaste, you've got to understand it, which means getting inside the mind of the ordinary objector to socialism. So we need to do some internal house cleaning as socialists, but also we need to do a better job of understanding our intellectual activist and political enemies. We can't just dismiss them as all corrupt and ignorant, uh, right, and so forth. So what Orwell is then proposing to do, and this is one of the great intellectual strengths of this book, is to do a very critical self-examination of what's going on inside socialism and a sympathetic but nonetheless critical examination of people who are outside of the socialist movement. And so he makes a point here of saying, when I'm doing this, always keep in mind, I am arguing for socialism, not against it, but for the moment I am 
advocatus diaboli. I'm the uh, advocate of uh, of the devil for this. I'm making the devil's arguments sympathetically, not because I believe them, but because I need we need to be uh, able to understand them well. So let's go inside socialism for a little while. First problem. The demographics are are uh, are not attractive. Uh, uh, Orwell wants to argue the typical socialist is not, as tremulous old ladies imagine, a ferocious-looking working man with greasy overalls and a raucous voice. No, that's the, the the cartoon version of what it is to be a socialism. But the reality is very different. Orwell wants to argue he is either a youthful snob Bolshevik. Now, Bolshevik is then a Marxist enamored with Soviet Russia uh, and what the uh, the Lenin led Lenin and Stalin and Trotsky led party had accomplished there. Uh, uh, very young and very snobbish superior in his sense that he has the answers to everything and uh, the rest of us should listen. So that snob Bolshevik and very young people who in five times will probably have made a wealthy marriage and been converted to Roman Catholicism. So a kind of suggestion that this is just youthful enthusiasm or youthful superficiality uh, in large numbers of people in the socialist movement. Or still more typically, a prim little man with a white collar job, usually a secret teetotaler and often with vegetarian leanings. Okay, so a, a nice cartoon description there, but what's interesting is that Orwell is saying that that is a huge uh, demographic within the socialist movement. Then it gets worse. In addition to this, there's the horrible, the really disquieting prevalence of cranks wherever socialists are gathered together. <clears throat> what is it about socialism, uh, Orwell wonders, it seems to attract all of these weirdos. Uh, and he gives a, a, an interesting list here. Fruit juice drinker, nudist, sandal wearer, sex maniac, Quaker, nature cure quack, pacifist, and feminist. All of them in England seem to be attracted to the socialist banner. You got to add the ugly fact that most middle class socialists, while theoretically pining for a classless society, cling like glue to their miserable fragments of social prestige. So we've got the prim little man uh, with his office job. We've got the, the, the snobbish Bolshevik young guy. We've got all of these weirdos. And then we've got a large number of just middle class people who kind of uh, would rather be middle class English people in their hearts of hearts uh, and merely mouth allegiance to uh, alliance with the, the working class. You can see the same tendency in socialist literature, which even when it is not openly written to how en bas, <clears throat> excuse my pronunciation, but from in a condescending tone from high to low is always completely removed from the working class in idiom and manner of thought. So the literature is written in this highbrow fashion with an overtone of condescension. That's a, a, a huge a rhetorical problem with socialist literature. He goes on then to say, to the extent that the communists have dominated the socialist movement, they're just filled with all of this technical jargon, the technical jargon of the communists. It is as far removed from the common speech as the language of a mathematical textbook. It just does not connect with the vast majority of people, uh, you know, office workers, working class people working with their hands and in the, in the fields and in the factories. They don't uh, get that literature. It's a complete waste of time in terms of forming the movement. So a couple of uh, disquieting problems then, and Orwell is giving us a laundry list, so to speak, of types uh, of problems to solve within the movement. Now, it might be said, and this be as an excusing point, it might be said, however, that even if the theoretical book-trained socialist is not a working man himself, at least he is actuated by love of the working class. Okay, so maybe they have bad rhetoric, maybe they're a little bit snobbish, but they really are motivated by the right thing, love of the working class. And Orwell is not so sure. Is it really that? Is it? But is it? Sometimes I look at a socialist, the intellectual tract writing type of socialist with his pullover, his fuzzy hair, and his Marxian quotation, and wonder what the devil his motive really is. It's often difficult to believe that it is a love of anybody, 
especially of the working class, from whom he is, of all people, the furthest removed. So he doesn't buy the off-sighted claim that I am, as a socialist, motivated by socialism. Something else seems to be going on, and what that something else is, uh, Orwell goes on to offer a suggestion. The underlying motive of many socialists, I believe, is simply a hypertrophied sense of order. So it's not love of the working class, it's order. I have a vision of how things should be organized, and I am in love with that vision, and everything should follow orderly in accordance with that vision, and I should have the power to be able to organize everything according to that vision of order. All right, and then he wants to uh, go on to argue that uh, in some sense you can see how this is manifested, uh, not only in from high to low condescending tone, but with the idea that I, as the socialist, need to have the power to force it even on the working class them, them, themselves. Uh, and this is the next paragraph here. Poverty. And what is more, the habits of mind created by poverty are something to be abolished from above, by violence, if necessary, perhaps even preferably by violence. So the attraction of this power motive, uh, that I am the one who has the answers, and I am going to make everybody do what I want to do according to my vision, and I am also perhaps attracted to the idea of doing it violently. And so something else is going on psychologically. And then he goes on to point out among many socialists, while they claim to be advocates egalitarianly of the vast working masses, right, and so forth, whom do they really admire? Hence, his worship of great men and appetite for dictatorships, fascist or communist. For to him, apparently, Stalin and Mussolini are almost equivalent persons. So Mussolini and Stalin are both great, powerful men who are able to wield lots of physical force and sometimes violence. That's the attraction there. The fact that one's a fascist, the other one is a communist, that's not quite so important to this type of person here. And in the nicer uh, Fabian socialists of England, the Webbs here, Mrs. Sidney Webb, you find the exact same sort of condescending, hi there, we'll do things my way from the top, and the unwashed mashers can just follow along with our plan for how society is. The truth is that to many people calling themselves socialists, revolution does not mean a movement of the masses with which they hope to associate themselves. It means a set of reforms which we, the clever ones, are going to impose upon them the lower orders. Though seldom giving much affection, uh, evidence of affection for the exploited, he is perfectly capable of displaying hatred. And this is interesting. Is it really love of the masses, uh, love of the oppressed, love of the exploited, or is it really hatred of the other, the rich, the powerful, the oppressor? Is it uh, that I really just hate those guys, but... You know, I can't just come out and say that I really hate these guys. I have to mask it in some love, apparently, for this other group. But really, the hate is what is operative here. A sort of queer, theoretical, in vacua hatred against the exploiters. Hence the grand old socialist sport, sport of denouncing the boor. So how much time is devoted to attacking the comfortable, attacking the rich, attacking the well-off compared to sympathizing and actually working with the poor and the exploited? It is strange how easily almost any socialist writer can lash himself into frenzies of rage. And then sometimes it might be a kind of class self-hatred that's involved here against the class which to which, rather, by birth or by adoption, he himself invariably belongs. So summarizing all of this, the fact is, Orwell says, that socialism, in the form in which it is now presented, appeals chiefly to unsatisfactory or even human, inhuman types.
And so he says it makes sense. The ordinary decent person who is in sympathy with the essential aims of socialism. Everybody's going to do their fair share of work. Everybody's going to be looked after. Everybody's going to get their fair share. There's enough to go around and so on. Okay, fine. I'm in, uh, I'm in favor of that uh, uh, a set of essential aims. But nonetheless, that person is given the impression that there is no room for his kind in any socialist party that means business. Now, he says, you know, uh, maybe this is a kind of ad hominem uh, argument that I'm developing here, or, or, or you know, I'm, I'm, I'm attacking the various constituents of the socialist movement, uh, and that's unfair. It doesn't prove anything. It, uh, you know, ad hominem argument we know is a fallacy. And Orwell is aware of this. So he says, it is not strictly fair to judge a movement by its adherence, but the point is that people invariably do so. And he goes on to say, you know, it's not just the, uh, the, the run-of-the-mill socialist activist of various sorts or the socialist theoretician, uh, people who are in the arts, uh, in music, also uh, who are socialists. They're not doing their job very well either. Uh, he offers an aesthetic commentary here. Nearly everything describable as socialist literature is dull, tasteless, and bad. Why are there no good socialist novels, no good socialist plays? And then he goes on to say the same thing with respect to music. I do think it a bad sign that it has produced no songs worth singing. All right, so this chapter is an internal diagnosis of the problems of socialism internally. Uh, and then we will do some further analysis in these chapters and then come to Orwell's conclusions, uh, which include his, his, uh, his recommendations for how to solve the problems that socialism faces. All right, next chapter. However, there is a more serious difficulty than the local and temporary objections which I discussed in the last chapter. And now, now we're going to start looking at people on the other side of the debate. Uh, 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 why are they not in the socialist camp? Faced by the fact that intelligent people are so often on the other side, okay, that's interesting. So Orwell is, you know, is willing to recognize as many people who are in the grip of a political ideology are not willing to recognize that often people who disagree with them are in fact intelligent people. It's always easier to say, oh, they're just stupid uh, uh, and so forth. Uh, faced by the fact that intelligent people are so often on the other side, the socialist is apt to set it down to corrupt motives, conscious or unconscious. Right? They've got a false consciousness uh, uh, that's been instilled in them, or they are just evil people rationalizing their 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 evil, or to an ignorant belief that socialism would not work, or to a mere dread of the horrors and discomforts of the revolutionary period before socialism is established. Okay, so undoubtedly, all of these are important, but there are plenty of people who are influenced by none of them. That is to say, they're not corrupt. They're not especially bothered by the, the horrors of, uh, of, of revolutionism uh, uh, <clears throat> and, and, and so forth, but they are nonetheless uh, uh, opposed to socialism. Now, why is this? And then again, just for a moment, we come back inside socialism. I have very seldom met a convinced socialism, socialist rather, who could grasp that thinking people may be repelled by the objective towards which socialism appears to be moving. So a lot of times people might say, well, you know, socialism is a great ideal. We just don't uh, think that it's very practical or we don't, socialism is a nice ideal, but I don't like those nasty methods of trying to bring it out, uh, bring it about that you are, you are offering. Orwell is saying there is an important, intelligent, well-meaning other group of people who disagree with the ends of socialism. They are repelled by the objective towards which socialism appears to be moving. And so what is that movement? Okay. And then, so he goes on in this next section here to discuss a Marxist writer who wants to say, you know, uh, there's lots of people who seem to be very intelligent, 
Uh, and uh, it seems like they should be, uh, you know, coming over to us on the socialist side and more specifically on the, the Marxist side. But they're going instead toward fascism. Why are they going toward fascism? Why is it the communist ideal instead of the fascist ideal uh, more attractive to them? All right. So uh, the context here, Orwell says, discussing the widely held theory, which in one sense is certainly true that fascism is a product of communism. So if you take communism, the argument is going to go, it's going in fact to generate more fascists than it is going to generate communists or communism in practice is going to lead to fascism in practice in some sense. And so the argument here that Holdaway, uh, uh, and Orwell is using him as a foil here, wants to argue that uh, uh, what happens is the working class under capitalism gets more and more uh, exploited and more and more oppressed. Okay. Uh, uh, and so much of socialism then uh, is going to be captured by these democratic types. They're not going to be revolutionary and so forth. And so what's then going to uh, result is that all of that energy is going to not be attracted to communism, but it's going to burst out in fascist form. And the fascists are going to be, by presenting a certain kind of ideal, more able to capture that group of people than the communists are for the same underlying economic problems that have been generated by capitalism. And so that's an analysis of why fascism is succeeding through a, 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 a communist lens. And Orwell wants to say he's sort of on the right track of something, but he has missed a bigger point. He has detected the underlying economic cause of fascism, but he tacitly assumes that the spiritual side is of no importance. And so it's the communist's materialism uh, as dismissing the unimportance of the psychological unimportance of the spiritual and so forth that sets them up for failure with respect to capturing the same group of people that the fascists are going off. Fascism is written off by the Marxists as a maneuver of the ruling class, which at bottom it is, but this in itself would only explain why fascism appeals to capitalists. And Orwell then says we want to look squarely at the real issue as, as a socialist. What about the millions who are not capitalists, who in a mere material sense have nothing to gain from fascism and are often aware of it and who nevertheless are fascists. So they are oppressed by capitalists. They recognize that they are oppressed by capitalists. They understand that Marxism is offering a certain economic analysis, but it's not that economic analysis that is appealing to them. So obviously their approach has been purely along the ideological line. They could only be stampeded into fascism because communism attacked or seemed to attack certain things. Patriotism, the love of one's country, religion, right? the love of whatever one's, uh, one's, one's, uh, one's uh, religious philosophy is, which lay deeper than the economic motive. So human beings are more complicated. They have a lot of fundamental motives. They love their country. They love their religion. Of course, they love money and they want to live very well. The Marxists and the socialists typically are emphasizing the economic and ignoring all of the rest. But the fascists appealing to the same sort of people are saying, yes, we will uh, you know, look after you economically, but we will not look at, attack your religion. We won't attack your, uh, your ethnicity. We won't attack your patriotism as well. And so we have a different, more robust ideology that is very attractive to that set of people. And so the way Orwell then goes on to put it here is to say it is the spiritual recoil from socialism, especially as it manifests itself in sensitive people that I want to discuss in this chapter. Okay, so uh, uh, hammering on the economic motive and attacking the nationalist or patriotic motive, uh, hammering on the economic motive and hammering on people's uh, uh, religious beliefs, that is a failed strategy. We have to 
uh, speak to people where they really are. And Marxist communism is not going to do so. So socialism is going to have to take this into, into account. Now, there's another issue with respect to the kind of ideal that is presented here. The idea of socialism is bound up more or less inextricably with the idea of machine production. Socialism is essentially an urban creed. It grew up more or less concurrently with industrialism. And so uh, the idea then is socialism is going to build on the industrial revolution, the organization of the workers into factories, creating all of the wealth. Uh, uh, and then the idea just is that the socialists will uh, confiscate all of that property and then uh, organize the society and keeping it going and tooting all of the, the redistribution. But all of that is going to require that we've achieved a high level of industrialization. <clears throat> but the effect of industrialism is to make it impossible for anyone to be self-supporting even for a moment. Industrialism, once it rises above a fairly low level, must lead to some form of collectivism. And so the socialists are grasping onto this. Everything is going to be made by the machines. It's going to be highly organized and everything is going to be collectivized. And we're starting to look like, you know, a worker bee hive kind of community. And how attractive is that as an ideal? The socialist world is always pictured as a completely mechanized immensely organized world depending on the machine as the civilizations of antiquity depended on the slave. And of course, uh, there's the danger that we will ourselves become slaves to the machine or just appendages of the machine. Now, that is the most prominent ideal of socialism that is being offered. Uh, by many of the socialists, but of course, especially by the Marxist socialists. And then uh, people recoil from that. I don't want that. The kind of person who most readily accepts socialism, though, is also the kind of person who views mechanical progress as such with enthusiasm. And there is so much the case that socialists are often unable to grasp that the opposite opinion exists. Right? A person who would recoil from that picture of high-tech, uh, uh, urban, organized, everybody working in the factory as an appendage to the machine. That, uh, that could, uh, that's not an ideal. That's, that's a horror to which I'm going to run away from. The socialist world is to be, above all things, an ordered world, an efficient world. And finally, you land up in the by now familiar this is H.G. Wells, kind of high science fiction uh, 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 utopia, aptly caricatured by Huxley in Brave New World, the paradise of little fat men. So <clears throat> if that's the ideal, mechanical progress leads to ultimately a society of little fat men. And isn't this an ideal? Wouldn't you like you and your children and your grandchildren to all become little fat men living in that kind of society? Uh, why aren't you a socialist? Right? And then Huxley, uh, sorry, uh, Orwell wants to say, well, it's obvious why lots of people don't want that in their lives. Um, it'll cause them to lose their sense of meaning in their lives and work, Orwell wants to go on to argue, is a central part of what it means to be a, a human being. The function of the machine is to save work. In a fully mechanized world, all the dull drudgery will be done by the machinery, leaving us free for more interesting pursuits. Now, that all sounds great and wonderful. But on the other hand, if the machines are doing all the work, the question arises, what else are they to do? We're going to take away everybody's work, and then we're going to be taking away something that makes them uh, human and gives them a sense of meaning in the life. Mechanize the world as fully as it might be mechanized, and whichever way you turn, there will be some machine cutting you off from the chance of working, that is, of leaving. So if the socialists then are saying to the working classes, yeah, we're going to mechanize everything, uh, isn't that beautiful? Well, the working classes are going to say, wait, you're going to put me out of a job. I'm not 
interested in that. Now, it's also then a kind of aesthetic reaction. How do you like the idea of everything run by the machines in this worker beehive uh, or, or shiny high-tech uh, kind of world? There's another kind of person who says, I don't want that. I want things a little more relaxed. I don't want to be in the city, in the factory. I want to be out in the countryside and, and, and be able to take it easy a little bit and everything a little bit messy and, and, and fuzzy. And so there's a huge <clears throat> number of people who want, as he puts it in this next paragraph, to revert to the handwork of a machine age. And you're back to ye old tea shop or the Tudor villa, which this, with the, uh, the sham beams tacked to the wall. So this ideal causes people to recoil and then want to go back to some vision of the idyllic good old days. And so socialism are, socialists rather are alienating people and turning them back into kind of reactionary conservatives of a, of a sort. Now, this is a problem <clears throat> Orwell wants then quickly to say <clears throat> he's not opposed to machines. Uh, the obvious fact is that the machine has come to stay. So it's not that we're going to go back to ye old England or the Middle Ages in some sense. We are going to go forward into the machine age. And he then wants to say, you know, the, the machine age has its problem. But what he's focusing on is this socialist uh, uh, hypertrophied version of a new machine age. And the way he puts it here... Socialism, progress, machinery, Russia, tractor, hygiene, machinery, progress. Uh, that uh, is what people say, and they be then become hostile to socialism. And Orwell well, puts himself a little bit in that court category. You know, I am a degenerate modern semi-intellectual who would die if I did not get my early morning cup of tea. Uh, that that, uh, that luxury that came into existence uh, and my new statesman every Friday. Clearly, I do not, you know, I like modern life and so forth. I do not in any sense want to return to a simpler, harder, probably agricultural way of life. And that's going to be millions and millions of people. In the same sense, I don't want to cut down on my drinking, pay my debts, take enough exercise, be faithful to my wife, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, and so, you know, I want my lifestyle, I want progress, I want my comforts and so forth. But I want a civilization, as he puts it here, in which progress is not definable as making the world safe for fat little men. And now back to fascism and the problem of fascism. Fascism coming to England, right? Fascism in Spain, fascism in <clears throat> Italy, a cousin of fascism uh, in, uh, in Germany, and there are fellow travelers in most other uh, countries in the world as well. When I speak of fascism, in England. I'm not necessarily thinking of Mosley, Oswald Mosley and his pimpled followers. Instead, fascism is, the way he puts it here, fascism as it appears in the intellectual is a sort of mirror image, not actually of socialism, but of a plausible travesty of socialism. So it comes from the same place, but it's then a perversion or a distortion. Something goes wrong in the kind of person who ordinarily should be a good socialist and converts them into a fascist. That's what we need to, to understand. So in order to combat fascism, it is necessary to understand it, which involves admitting that it contains some good as well as much evil. So it's not that the fascists are completely alien and the socialists are completely alien. Uh, Orwell wants to recognize that there's much overlap between fascism and socialism. And we have to, if we are honest, recognize this. And one of those overlap things is the underlying feeling as he starts to describe it. The underlying feeling of fascism, the feeling that first draws people into the fascist camp, may be less contemptible. Everyone who has given a moment to, uh, uh, given the movement rather, so much as a glance, knows that the rank and file fascist is often quite a well-meaning person, quite an genuinely anxious, for instance, to better the lot of the unemployed. 
Right? So, socialists are concerned with the poor and the unemployed, and that's supposed to be a good, genuine, healthy motivation that underlies socialism. But Orwell says it seems to be the case that for millions of people attracted to fascism, that is the exact same underlying motive that is, is going on. And of course, not all fascists fit into that type. There is the fascist bully type, even the fascist bully at his symbolic worst with a rubber truncheon in his in one hand and castor oil bottle in the other, does not necessarily feel himself a bully. More probably, he feels like Roland in the past at Roncevo, defending Christendom against the barbarians. So, of course, there are a lot of brutal, savage, beastly types of fascists, but if you get inside their heads, what they are arguing is that we live in a brutal, beastly kind of world, and so if we're going to prevail, we need to uh, uh, be, in some sense, beastly ourselves in order to bring about the right kind of improvement. And so it's, uh, you know, I'm, I'm more like a lion fighting against the hyenas and the jackals. Uh, and and, and you know, to the extent that I, you look at me as a, as a as, as as someone who's just you know killing and ripping and terroring and gorging on blood and how nasty that is, well, in some sense, from the lion's perspective, the lion is living up to his highest ideals in the brutal world that uh, is is real world. So. Um, <clears throat> partly, then, the additional problem is the mistaken communist tactic of sabotaging democracy. Okay, so the fascists are more likely and more willing, then, to play a democratic game as well. Uh, 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 so they will uh, put themselves in forming parties, they will form coalitions, they won't uh, overtly call for violence, or they will be a little slower to get to the violence. So they're more willing to be flexible and work with the democratic system. That works to their advantage, unlike the communists who have been going for a violent revolution from, from the get-go. So. They, and this is the socialist now, have never made it sufficiently clear that the essential aims of socialism are justice and liberty, with their eyes glued to economic facts. Uh, they have proceeded on the assumption that man has no soul, and explicitly, excuse me, or implicitly, they have set up the goal of a materialist utopia. That's the problem with the dominant strain intellectually within the socialist movement. As a result, fascism has been able to play upon every instinct that revolts against hedonism and a cheap conception of progress. So whatever good fascism contains is also implicit in socialism. So they both are coming from the same place. They're both initially the same good instincts, but the general philosophies, the general understanding of human nature, the general strategies have been quite different. And Orwell here is saying the dominant socialist strategies have been the wrong ones or overstated ones, and the fascists have done a much better job. So, Surveying the territory, <clears throat> socialism is the only real enemy that fascism has to face. Capitalism is, is done. It's not going to fight against the fascists. The fascists uh, can, can and will win. So the only question then is whether socialism or fascism is going to, uh, going to prevail. So then we have a summary paragraph here. Socialism is this uh, kind of high-tech world, high, uh, worker bee world. Everything is orderly. Everything is super efficient. But at the same time, the uh, socialist movement has all of these weird intellectual types, weird veganist and other types uh, as well. And so it seems to be a movement of cranks and weirdos, or it is sold out to uh, uh, to, uh, to 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 Russia and the, the communist experiment that's going on there, and that attacks people's sense of patriotism, and that attacks because the Marxists are atheists, it attacks their religion, and so the socialist movement in the 1930s, from Orwell's perspective, is in big problem, and he's identified what he takes to be the major problem. So now we turn to solutions. And finally, is there anything one can do about it. Well, everyone who knows the meaning of poverty, everyone who has a genuine hatred of tyranny and war is on the socialist side, potentially. So Orwell is saying, 
given our conception of what socialism really is, its core underlying feeling, generic center, and its understanding of its values, we have a huge, huge potential audience, a sympathetic audience towards that. So what we then need to do is find a better way to market to those people. And some of those people are just a little bit alienated and some have gone over to the enemy camp. So first, the enemies themselves, how can we reconcile uh, uh, socialism with the better of the enemies? I mean, all of those people who grasp that capitalism is evil, but who are conscious of a sort of queasy, shuddering sensation when socialism is uh, 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 mentioned. So first thing is he wants to say, we're not going to go back to the good old days. Uh, 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 we can't do that. It's just not going to happen. So mechanical process is going to happen, but we can't do the overselling and that hyper sense that the Marxist socialists want to want to argue. The choice is not and it should not be between a human and an inhuman world. It is simply a battle between socialism and fascism, which uh, fascism then at its best is just socialism with the virtues without. So he wants to say is our strategy then should be to recognize that the most important issue is getting all of the socialists together and stop focusing on less important issues. Right? So our battles within ourselves, our battles with this, that, and the other group says the real battle right now is uh, uh, capitalism has impoverished most people and fascism has conquered half of Europe. So this uh, sentence here, to oppose socialism now when 20 million Englishmen are underfed, that's the fault of capitalism on Orwell's analysis. And fascism has conquered half of Europe. That is suicidal. All right. So <clears throat> as secondly, as to the socialist himself, especially the vocal tract writing type of socialist, internally, we need to get our act together. We are at a moment when it is desperately necessary for left wingers of all complexions to drop their differences and hang together. Right. So get rid of the internal factions, uh, uh, get rid of the internal personal animosities. Keep your eye on the bigger issue, which is the movement. Uh, and the movement needs to be together if it is going to be effective. Sometimes when I listen to these people talking, that is to say his internal uh, socialists, especially those in the, in the Labour Party, when I read their books, I get the impression that to them the whole socialist movement is no more than a kind of exciting heresy hunt, a leaping to and fro of frenzied witch doctors to the beat of tom-toms and the tune of fee-fi-fo-fum, I smell the blood of a right-wing deviationist. Unquote. So uh, instead of uh, focusing on our other socialists with an eagle eye and trying to see which one has said something wrong and then attacking that person, instead seeing that person as an ally. And yes, that person has said something wrong, but we can overlook that because we have bigger fish to fry. It also means uh, with respect to uh, uh, the nationalism uh, and the overly theoretical nature of much of socialism. At this moment, it is a waste of time to insist that acceptance of socialism means an acceptance of the philosophic side of Marxism plus adulation of Russia. So you don't have to be a philosopher. You don't have to have all the technical. You don't have to be abstract. Plain, simple language, plain, simple so socialism for the ordinary person. That's what we need to work on. And we don't have to say that you have to kind of hate England and love Russia if you're going to be a good socialist. You can love England and be indifferent. You can be a patriot and still be a part of the socialist movement as well. As for minor differences and the profoundest philosophical difference is unimportant compared with saving the 20 million Englishmen whose bones are rotting from malnutrition. Poverty is the problem. That's the dominant problem. We solve that when everything else, put it on the shelf for a generation or two. Now, 
When, with respect to England, though, uh, Orwell wants to insist and highlight on one other special important. Setting aside all of these differences, very hard for most English people with their class history. Yeah, the, the sense that you are, you know, in uh, you know the upper, lower, middle, central class, or whatever it is, and all of these very fine class gradations, and the idea that what you want is to be comfortable in your own class and perhaps gen uh, nudge yourself up into the next class if you possibly can, and not to associate with people who are of a slightly lower class. And so he uses as an example uh, Shakespeare. Now he's fine with Shakespeare. Shakespeare is a great writer, and so forth, but. We should not be literary snobs uh, in our uh, use of language and saying uh, that we're trying to get the workers to understand uh, Shakespeare, and if they don't get it, we're going to look down upon them in some particular way. And so get rid of, for example, the insistence that we have to be highbrow intellectual types and we've got the perfect theoretical system worked out. Shakespeare is not very helpful in uh, rallying people to the cause. Let's not insist on Shakespeare as well. So that, however, is the mentality that drives ordinary sensible people away from the socialist movement. But for many people, you know, Shakespeare is an Englishman and, he, uh, and it's a mark of being uh, uh, you know, a higher class person. If you read Shakespeare, if you go to Shakespeare plays, if you can quote Shakespeare and so forth, and that really is important to so many English people's consciousness, Orwell is arguing. And so uh, the idea that they have to get rid of that and start associating with people who've never heard of Shakespeare, would never be able to understand Shakespeare, they don't want to do it. And so it's their class allegiance more than their economic interests that is important to them. That has to change. This raises a great difficulty. It means that the issue of class as distinguished from a mere economic status has got to be faced more realistically than it is being faced at present. No matter what the class is, economic interests, especially the attack on poverty, has to uh, be, uh, be put be, uh, be put to the fore. And here uh, Orwell wants to say, you know, that we have this notion of what it is to be a member of the working class, and then we immediately start thinking of factory workers, or we perhaps start thinking about farmers. But Orwell wants to say we should be drawing our socialism from uh, and, and integrating our socialist movement into all kinds of other people. What about that far larger class running into millions this time, the office workers? and black-coated employees of all kinds, whose traditions are less definitely middle class, but who would certainly not thank you if you called them proletarians. And so they're kind of lower middle class. They're not working with their hands in the factories or the fields. They are, in fact, working in the, in the offices, right? uh, but they don't want to think of themselves as the proletariat. And if you have to insist that they are going to do so, there's a resistance. But that's the precisely the issue that we have to, to overcome. Those people who are working in an office, but nonetheless not making very much money on the point of, on the brink of poverty, have the same economic interests as people who are working in the factories, working in the fields, and so forth. And they are all victims of the same, uh, the same, uh, uh, the same brutal economic system. So they should be working together. The class distinctions, as they exist in England, are an obstacle to that. And so that kind of person, uh, if we raise the specter of fascism again, is more likely than to say, well, if you socialists tell me I have to work with the uh, with the, you know, the, 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 the farmers with, uh, you know, cow shit on their boots, I don't want to do that. I'd rather become a fascist than than that kind of uh, that kind of socialist. So socialists have a big job ahead of them. They have got to demonstrate beyond the possibility of doubt just where the line of cleavage between exploiter and exploited comes. Perhaps we could do with a little less talk about capitalist and proletarian and a little more about the robbers and the robbed. It directs attention away from the central fact that poverty is poverty, whether you, the tool you work with is a pickaxe or a fountain pen. So to summarize, beyond all else, therefore, we, that is to say, this new socialist movement or the reformed socialist movement that uh, Orwell wants to be a part of, we need intelligent propaganda. 
less about class consciousness, expropriation of the expropriators, bourgeois ideology, and proletarian solidarity, not to mention their sacred sisters, thesis, antithesis, and synthesis. More about justice, liberty, and the plight of the unemployed. Less about mechanical progress, tractors, the Dnieper Dam, and the latest salmon canning factory in Moscow. That kind of thing is not an integral part of socialist doctrine, and it drives away many people whom the socialist cause needs, including most of those who can hold a pen. All that is needed is to hammer home two facts into the public consciousness. One, that the interests of all exploited people are the same. The interests of all exploited people are the same, not class, not nation, economic interests. And the other, that socialism is compatible with common decency. It's not highbrow, it's not overly intellectualized, it's not filled with jargon, it's no looking down condescendingly at the lower orders. Common decency is widespread, that's what socialism is about. All right, Road to Wigan Pier, George Orwell, 1937.